everyone. Thank you for coming today. I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity to speak to you. I know none of you chose it, but I'm just going to pretend like you did. Um, I'm particularly happy you came here today because it's freezing outside, and my graduate assistant Lauren and I walked here from Ruffner, and uh, I realized I'm no longer a Yankee. Um, I'm from upstate New York and grew up with the cold, and now I'm a damn Yankee. I've learned that down here, that those people who come down here never leave, and I am among you and proud to be because I don't own a winter coat anymore, and I'll just suck up this this day once in a while, but regardless, I'm really happy that you came out. My name's Nick. I um, helped create the Instructional Technology Department here at Longwood. Um, I oversee our Office of Continuing Ed and Professional Studies these days, but I've worked as a school district administrator in New York State. I've been a teacher. Um, my doctoral work is in educational leadership, and that's very important to me, as is workforce and career readiness. And for most of my career, I worked in instructional technology and distance learning. Today I want to talk about instruction and technology together and try and give you some pointers on what I'm finding is really important right now. And it may or may not be similar to some of the things that you are or will be hearing in some of your classes. First thing, and you probably all know this, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood what I mean by this concept, is I wanted to just mention inverted classroom pedagogy. It's the same thing as flipped classroom, but it's the idea that anything that's sort of rote or things that you can do again and again every semester or year is to try and put that outside of the classroom as much as possible. So anything that you could record or document, have your students interact with that before they come see you so that you can then do more higher order thinking activities and exploration as individuals and as groups and apply what their your students are learning to their real world lives. Um, and we're going to talk more about this, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood this concept and that it is now actually really possible to do this well. People have been talking about it for about 20 years now, but it wasn't until technology, the ease of use of it actually stepped up before people really started to be able to engage in this well. So I want to ask you why lectures are boring. It's because people like me stand in front of people like you for three hours at a time and just talk to you. And you stare on your phone, you just like doodle, like what do I have to do tonight? Should I go to 202? Is it a happy hour? Should I go to the Mexican place because it's happy hour on Monday? No, it's not Monday, it's Tuesday. What do I going to do? And you have every reason to think that way. Why? Because lecture is boring. You need to remember that. I knew it as a kid growing up. I knew it going through college. Most of my educational experiences were direct one way. And this, most of this can be done outside of class. And it scares the crap out of people who have been teaching for a long time, which means that you're the only hope. You're the only hope for the human race people. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to give you some tips on how you can be a little, a little better at providing hope. Um, so everyone loves a DVR. I can't live without my Netflix. Um, I need to be able to say things. I need to be able to watch things. And if I'm learning, I need to be able to re-watch things. Because when I absorb something the first time, I'm picking out little things that I'm interested in. And then I'm forgetting 90% of it. And most people sort of think that way. I want you to get comfortable with the idea of recording yourself. It doesn't have to be perfect. I record myself all the time, and I say dumb things. I am sometimes too honest. Sometimes I'll fumble my words or have an accident. The last time we did a seminar, I recorded it, and there was some weird timing thing on my PowerPoint. I kept running back and forth, and that's OK. The students don't expect something perfect. And actually, the research shows that if you present something to your students, and it's so polished and perfect, um, it sort of dissuades them in some way because it makes them feel like it's not as real. So if you're talking like your normal self and you're sort of fumbling your way through your points, it makes it more connected for them. So be comfortable with that. But get used to using technology to get yourself online. Get comfortable with YouTube. YouTube has gotten way better than it used to be. I mean, you can just record yourself, you can make it password protected, 
you can whip it out to your students. Students can review it, and they can record things on it themselves. I taught a class not long ago where I made the students, uh, high school students, record themselves giving an elevator pitch basically to an admissions officer or a potential employer sharing why they had value. And this was important because I know a lot of really bright young people who, if you walk up to a young man and say, hey man, what are you good at? A lot of the people are just be like, I don't know. And you know they're brilliant. So getting your students to use the technology to create a digital, <laughs> digital presence for themselves and using this technology to create a digital presence for yourselves is going to be super important, particularly when you want to get a job or you're looking for another job. You need to have artifacts online that say that you are more interesting than just what's on that piece of paper. Okay? So there's a lot of tools. Um, there's Digo. It's a, a way to sort of do research online, and you can follow people who do research in interesting ways. So if you're an early childhood major, you, you could follow an early childhood teacher's research interests. You can follow scholars this way. Really interesting stuff. There's a lot of sites that are similar, but just keep your eye out on it. Um, Jing and other tools that let you record yourself online for free are really wonderful. Get used to just fumbling around with it. It's really easy to use, and if you're, whatever you're worried, just ask the kids to show you how to do it, because they'll learn it. So what the hell do I do in a classroom if I'm not going to lecture to you? And there's a couple bullet points that I put down quickly, with all of which are important. One is you need to talk to your students. You need to have normal discussions. You need to have non-canned discussions. Because if you're just talking at your students, there's no way that they can really apply that to their, to their lives the way you want them to, the way you want them to retain information. In the class, it should be all about applying what they're learning to their lives in some way. Just the way what you're learning here, you need to apply to your lives in some way. That's why you have to go out and do the, your student teaching. You have to really go out and figure out, do I really want to be an English teacher? I used to date this girl. She was the Clinique counter girl at a Macy's. And I worked in the suit department. Here comes the bad movie plot, right? Um, she was going to school to be an English teacher. She went through all the way through and got a teaching job. She may or may not have put her heart into the internship experience, and she quit the first week. And she, now she sells insurance because she did not spend enough time learning in that field whether or not she was interested in applying herself for those um, in that field. So keep that in mind. I really think it's important for you and your students to be able to do that. You can have meaningful dialogue. If you're into Bloom's tax taxonomy, you can do all the higher order stuff if you have the time to do it. And you empower your students to find problems and then solve them. And then I want to introduce you to the seven habits of highly effective people idea of synergy, which is the idea that you and someone else or a group of people can do things together better than any individual could have alone. And you need to encourage that with your students because they're an incredibly social generation. And we need to teach them how to be social thoughtfully, um, not just social because you happen to be online and it's easy. Um, use technology students can interact with. Um, you, there's EDU blogs. I'll talk about blogs in, in a minute. I mean, people have always had blogs in the last several years. but. They're now actually starting to be used in very interesting ways that I think you'll like when I, when I get there. There's Nearpod. It's a piece of software you stick on an iPad. So if you had a classroom full of iPads, one student can share their screen out with all the others. And the teacher could take over. They can give quizzes on there. The teacher can annotate. Um, the students can annotate. There's really interesting tools that you can use if appropriate. Um, I put the smart board up there. Um, people focus on that a lot. Um, you should be comfortable <laughs> using them. But if you're uncomfortable with how to use them well, I would highly recommend that you ask your students to come in and spend a little time every day or each week showing you how it works. And just empower them to go, hey, we're doing photosynthesis this week. Go to Promethean Plant, find me a good photosynthesis um, template for the Promethean board to tell me why or why not it would be a good <coughs> teaching tool in our class. Empower your students to go out and find stuff for you because they have 
these abilities that you may or may not do with the next step. Um, that is just a given, but you should just feel comfortable leveraging them and empowering them to go out and answer questions and solve problems. And you can use Twitter in some interesting ways, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and as a teacher, here's the thing. When, because you can get everything so easily on the internet, we have an entire generation or generations of people who don't have to think critically often if they don't want to. Because you can type something into a search engine and your answer's right there. You don't have to spend time figuring out why that may or may not be right. So that is a problem for you and it's a problem for the kids in the sense that you need to be able to think critically and figure out if information's correct for you or others. And you need to know how you think about searching for things. It sounds weird, but if you want to teach people to find information that's going to help and empower their hopefully happy, wealthy, and healthy lives, you need to know how you think too. So how do I think? How do I query? How do I look for information? And is what I'm doing a little wonky? Am I, am I off? Uh, you should know that. And then try and correct for it. How do I contribute to the world around me? And even if you don't contribute a lot or you don't think you do, you should at least understand what that is. And how do, this is particularly true for teachers, how do I get the family involved? And I mean the family of your students. How do you incorporate them into your teaching to encourage your students to stay engaged and to nurture that community? And I'm going to give you a couple examples and things that I want to talk to you about. But when in doubt, and this is true for you, and it's true for your students, bow before Google. If you have a weird thought, someone's typed it into Google long before you got it. And you're going to get an even weirder answer, but I want you to love Google. I love you, Google. <laughs> um, seriously, Google's fantastic, but you need to think critically when you use it. You need to just not accept that everything's true. Like, you could say, did Auburn lose last night? You could type that into a search engine, and that would be very matter of fact. Yeah. Some other things, not so much. And I want to show you some fun examples of that so that you can promote critical thinking in your class. <laughs> so this is the nefarious Pacific Northwest octopus. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, so OK. Then you know what? I think someone's been using the resources I've been sharing here. That's awesome. Um, this is, I got from Alan November, who's a great educator who's got examples like this. You might want to look them up. <coughs> and he was sharing examples at this, uh, uh, was it Virginia School Boards Association had a conference this past summer I presented at, and he was one of the keynotes. And he shared this. Um, at, and there are people who actually believe that the stuffed animal in the tree is a real deal octopus. And unfortunately, that stuffed animal's not alive, people. <laughs> it's not alive. I'm going to leave it at that. A legitimate example that you can use, particularly for you history people, um, is let's talk about the American Revolution. Enter in studying the American Revolution in Google at any point. You're going to get a, an American-centric view of the uh, American Revolution. You're going to have articles and history. But if you were to type in site colon school UK, and then studying the American Revolution, you're going to get the search results from the British. And you could do that for anything tied to geography. Have your students look at both outside of class or at the beginning of class, and then put them in groups and say, hey, listen, how are these similar? How are they different? And why is that so? And what makes that important to you? It might not be important to you, but at least to be able to distinguish that. There's certainly examples that you're going to be like, this has no relevance to me, like the octopus. You might be like, I like stuffed animals. I particularly like my little pony. I like my magic treehouse books. But I'm not a big fan of octopi. Um, so you've got that. So here's an example. Let me show you another one. This one's great. You might have seen this one by now. But uh, this is uh, martinlutherking.org. Go to this website, it looks like a legitimate site dedicated to the historical influence of Martin Luther King. But the website is hosted by um, Stormfront, which is a white supremacist group. And they set the site up to sort of 
put misinformation out there about um, his historical legacy and some, some other things that they're interested in. And you wouldn't know it because it's a .org. It's martinlutherking.org. And you know how you find that out with websites? Is you put link colon in front of a site, and you can see who points to your website. Um, I used to do that to figure out sort of reverse stock people who came to my website years ago, particularly when I was looking for work. You know, I'd put in a job application, and I'd see, oh, someone went to my website. I hope it was from this school. I know they're going to hire me. And then it was never them. It was like a bot trying to categorize my website for, for Google or something. But you need to teach your students how not to trust what they see automatically. There are some things they can do that with, but you need to teach them how to think critically. And then there's my favorite one. There was a research study online about feline reactions to bearded men. Come to find out that cats are afraid of bearded men. Um, and oddly enough, this website, it, I can't remember the university, but I think it might, someone who says they're from like the University of Southern California or something says that this is a legitimate research study. And the person who shared this with me shared the story of how uh, a student had presented this and cited this as a legitimate research for why um, they were trying to assert some point in an assignment. And I just love, I love the picture too. You know, like just holding up that, it looks like a cat I have too. Uh, but you should totally uh, use stuff like this. But the idea is like once a week or um, however often is comfortable for you, engage your students in activities that allow them to go online and think critically and explore different ideas and then give them opportunities to talk to each other about it and you and then apply it to themselves so that they can hopefully retain that information and eventually get a job with it. So obviously, you know, you want to learn this because precision and power to narrow your search with much better quality and results is really important. There's a lot of simple file, Google file types that you can use. Um, one I like is just file type colon PPT or doc or PDF. This is really good if you're looking for a specific type of thing. So if you were, you know, an ESL teacher and you were looking for a PowerPoint on something tied to ESL, you go to ESL and put file type PPT and it's gonna, you're gonna get this sea of interesting, somewhat similar presentations pop up. So get used to using this, get comfortable with empowering your students to use different operators when they're doing a search. I'm not gonna talk like a librarian and tell you that every single one. There's just a handful that they should know how to use and you should uh, get them to do it. Just so that they're exposed to it, they know how to find information later. All right, so your students as classroom scribes, I want to give you some ideas that you can use in your classroom. This, I keep seeing again and again, helps to keep classes more social, where you give people roles in your class that change with some regularity, where you have the student go on to the blog, your blog is you in the class. It could be password protected if your schools are freaked out about security. You could go in and every day a different student or the same student for a week could go in and document everything that happens all throughout the class. And then you could have someone be the photographer for that day. You could have someone videotaping what they think are, are relevant things throughout that day. You could have someone designing different activities, um, giving people roles to that are help to response, that are, that are responsible for helping to facilitate the educational environment is really important because it's not you to them. It's you together trying to move it all along with you trying to nudge them. Um, so try and get used to doing things like this. You can have an official Twitter person if you wanted to, like, hey, we're going to tweet out something really interesting. Um, don't use Twitter just to use Twitter, though. I'll show you an example of how using Twitter would be good in a minute. But get used to changing roles in your classes for your students. And the scribe example is really good over time for you as the teacher because you're going to see what your students are paying attention to. So you're gonna find the holes. You're gonna be like, well, this kid just keeps talking about um, photosynthesis when you know, there's some other things that we really, uh, I felt were gonna be on a test or were really important to learn about um, that you can then go back and revisit. I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but that's actually appropriate to say. But um, you get the general idea. So let me take you to the, the next one. 
And this is really interesting with using mobile media. And a really interesting way to engage people with their cell phones is to have your first parent teacher night be about, partly about, having your parents come in and you helping them to set up their phones to receive information from you. So it could be a tweet, uh, it could be um, instant messaging, it could be something tied to your blog that will automatically send them things so that you can, throughout the day, send information out. You can have even a student be responsible for this if you want to go there, or you at different times. Like this is a real example of a teacher who took a picture of a whiteboard in the class. <laughs> Students were learning about earthworms and night crawlers. The parent can see that and go, hey, how's the earthworm assignment coming along? It allows you to make the parents a little more to help you to keep the students motivated and involved. And this is particularly valuable for parents uh, who aren't native English speakers. It's very helpful for them to see how their kids are learning to try and get more connected to what they're doing and to help the parents learn at the same time. And you could just take pictures of things and use them for instruction. Your students take pictures all day long. Like here's a shower curtain. You can have measure the, the angles in it. Um, you know, try and think of interesting ways to use the, the devices they have, because they all have them, and so do you. So why not use them in interesting ways, but together? Um, so let's keep moving along here. Um, the secret to using social media is not about you or me. It's, it's about levering, leveraging peer pressure. It's kind of like how athletes work well together. Um, they develop this discipline and respect and they keep motivating each other to do things because they don't want to disappoint each other. That's how you should really be thinking about using um, social media and getting your students online. Is give them opportunities to work together and give them opportunities to express themselves outwardly, to, and especially digitally, because they want to create a digital stamp that is seen by others and they want to contribute. Uh, and this is global now because everyone's connected online. So creating opportunities for your students to be able to do that is one of the most important uses of social media that, that, that you can really employ. Um, and your students are going to ask your, their peers for help before they're really going to ask you. And if you engage them in problem finding, this can really be successful. And in today's world, every student has to become the teacher. And it basically comes back to the why PowerPoint is boring. If you're just being talked to the whole time, what have you really learned? You're going to memorize something to be able to beat a test. You're going to be able to, you'll remember something interesting and you'll share with someone else, but over time, does it really add value to what you offer to a potential employer? Not really. So you need to create opportunities for your students to retain information and apply it so that it'll, it'll stick in the thick skulls. You know, that kid who I know, who I said, you know, what are you good at, man? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, I know you're brilliant. I've been teaching you for almost three months now, and I know you're really smart. He's like, I don't know. And it comes down to establishing, and this is important for all of you too, a really thoughtful, forward-thinking digital presence. So you need to get yourself online as much as your students do, because if you want to get a job, you need to be interesting. You need to make yourself unique, distinct, in some way, aside from just being uh, an 8 by 11 piece of paper or a couple pages uh, for a resume. You need to do more than that because everyone's online, and when everyone's online, um, we're less valuable to the employers initially. So you need to do something that allows you to quickly articulate what you're good at. Um, without them having to ask you often. And one of the things I wanted to leave you with is a research focus of mine is a, this question I've been researching for several years now, and it's how do we correct for the disconnect between the habits and skills that young people have and those skill sets that businesses doing hiring today now require. So we pump out, and this is true for colleges and K-12, a lot of students who aren't qualified for, for jobs that are available and I want you to really be mindful of, of, of that. Think of those qualities that a potential employer wants to see. And there's a lot of research that suggests that some of these are, are among them, and that's communication, presentation, teamwork, leadership, time management, networking, professionalism, problem solving, critical thinking, 
and habits for success. Like what, what do successful people do? Uh, how do they carry themselves that allow them to really get the work? And it's more important than ever to be able to speak well, to be able to articulate what you're good at because you don't have much time to impress somebody anymore. You have far less time than you used to and you're competing with people who network well, you're competing with people who know people and that's how most people get the good jobs is from who they know. So I wanna see you out networking. I want you to think, and I want you to promote this with your students, how can you do good things and still pay the rent? I remember I went to undergraduate school for English and philosophy, right? And I literally could not move out of my parents' basement when I graduated because I was a really deep thinker. Um, and I could tell a deep and thoughtful story about the tie I was selling someone at Macy's, but I couldn't move in with my girlfriend, my now wife, because I didn't really have any legitimate skills um, that an employer would want. So I went back to school to be an educator, um, which is kind of funny, but I went back to school to be an educator because I needed to learn something that would actually help me to get a job. So always keep that in the back of your mind. How can you apply what you're learning? How is it relevant to your career goals? And promote that with your students, because ultimately, part of what measures their success as an adult is their ability to go out in the world and, uh, and pay for themselves to live and have that healthy, happy life that they want so badly. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, you guys are awesome. And uh, thank you, and stay warm. Thank you.